that bird, and this is a laser. It's a single fiberglass boat with one sail, and it's the world's most popular adult sail boat. And a whole lot of fun to sail downwind. Usually lasers sail just a short distance from shore. And when I tell people I plan to sail one across that straight, they can't believe it. In fact, the more people I told them my idea, the more I heard it was a bad idea. The wind will be too strong. The waves will be too big. The mast will break. The sail will rip in half. You'll get tired and have to be rescued. I think the idea for this crossing of Bass Strait and the laser came up when a few of us laser guys were sitting around in a circle. Uh, we were a bit uh, sort of a, a bored with traditional sort of racing the laser and we wondered what sort of exciting thing we could do uh, to, to make it a bit more you know, exciting, a bit more entertaining. And the first thing we came up with was sailing a laser in some waves and surfing and maybe uh, trying to get down the waves and have a bit of fun and, and uh, maybe crash and break the mast and that sort of thing and catching it all on film at the same time. Uh, and then we thought at the end of this sort of footage would need a, a big stunt, something spectacular and that, that stunt was going across Bass Strait and uh, now I'm just working on the Bass Strait side of things. I started sailing when I was about eight years old. I started in little boats, just mucking around, uh, capsizing, swimming around the boats and having fun and that sort of stuff. Uh, it wasn't until I was sort of in my late 20s that I started to get serious about it and uh, start training hard for sailing. At university I studied sports science and I learned about how to train and how to get fitter for sport and psychology and nutrition and all those sorts of areas. And I put those things I learned into practice, sailing my laser and, and setting my own training. Uh, and, and those things I learned and, and about how to train and how to improve, those got me to the Olympics and, and got me the experience there. And those things will also help me uh, get across the, the Bass Strait. I was lucky enough to compete in the Sydney Olympics and that was the most awesome experience. I mean, all the time, I, in the five years beforehand, I was out training on Sydney Harbour. It was my backyard, basically. You know, you go and play backyard cricket. That was my backyard for sailing. And uh, and then it finally came September 2000, and the Olympics came to us. And if you look at it all together, to be the right age, to be the right sort of temperament, uh, and to be selected for your country, to while the Olympics are actually on there, it's just to have that all to go your way. My laser sailing career, I've been to the Olympics three times. I've been to 96 games in Atlanta, 2000 games in Sydney, where I managed to win the bronze medal, and the Athens games. In that time, I've also been ranked number one in the world for a number of months. And all that round the boys racing, I think, has, has led me to want to try and do something a little bit different, and that is to sail across Bass Strait in the laser. When I told my mum that I was going to sail across Bass Strait, she thought about it for a second. Darling, I think you should apply your efforts to something else. That's right. I wasn't keen on the idea to start with. Imagine your son doing this. I'm Judy, Michael's mum. When I look back over my life to date, I sort of wonder why I might be driven to try and achieve uh, a, lot, a lot in sport and in, uh, in some other sides of things. And in some respects, I, I think I boil it down to one little uh, year or two when I was six or seven. I played rugby union uh, here in Sydney. We had a, had a pretty good team, a really good coach. And we went through two seasons uh, where we lost only three games. We won both grand finals. And somehow I think just there in those couple of years when I was really young, I just got used to winning, got used to doing really well at sport. And somehow that I think that just carried through. That's what I, if I really think about and analyse it, that's what it seems to come down to. A few other things, of course, significant events happen in my life, but... Uh, that success at the, the rugby union when I was really young and very <laughs> impressionable little boy is probably the thing that stands out the most. But now motivation for to doing well at sport comes from different things and, and when you get to the sort of the, when you're just trying to get to the Olympic level you wonder can I do it, can I get there, can I make the sort of jump from being really good in your own country to re being really good in the world. And there was a, a time there where I was training really hard and every day I thought I don't think I can make it, but every day I thought oh, I can probably make it if I just 
keep this going, keep the goals going. And eventually, the I, I could make it, beat the I, I couldn't make it. And having a little bit of success under your belt on the international sort of level encourages a lot more for the future. The question now is, could Michael cross Bass Strait? It won't be easy. Bass Strait is relatively shallow and it's exposed to the cold, strong weather fronts from the Southern Ocean. So located at around 40 degrees south, the strait leaves sailors unprotected against the howling winds of the Roaring Forties, which have proven fatal. But any patch of ocean can be deadly if conditions are extreme and the craft are unsuitable. Michael's priority is to get across safely by being well prepared and by sailing in manageable conditions. Michael has spent four months preparing specifically for the crossing. He's trained on the water, in the gym and on a bike. He's analysed the weather history of the area, the potential routes, the tidal flow, the average speeds possible in a laser and come up with a plan. He would sail from south to north, from Tasmania to the mainland, across the strait, propelled by the regular southwest winds. It's really important for Michael to sail most of the way in daylight. Sailing Bass Strait in a laser may be dangerous enough during the day, but a lot more so at night, so he needs to maximise daylight sailing hours so he can see the waves and keep the boat upright. It's now March, and if he doesn't attempt the crossing soon, he'll have to wait for longer days next summer. So he put his laser on the roof of his car and headed down to Sorrento in Victoria, at the bottom of mainland Australia. Sorrento is located on Port Phillip Bay, just a few kilometres from the heads which open up into Bass Strait. There he met up with Tim Phillips, who will skipper the support boat. Tim owns and runs the wooden boat shop, and he made this boat a beautiful Cheviot 32, which they're using as a support boat. After finding a window in the weather, they put the laser on the back of the Cheviot and motor across to Stanley on the northwest tip of Tasmania. Bass Strait doesn't get much calmer than this. It's from Stanley that Michael will attempt to sail back to mainland Australia, landing at Wilson's Promontory, a distance of 115 nautical miles, or 207 kilometres. After 14 hours of motoring, they arrive in Stanley. And soon after, a new southwest front comes through. Now they will wait in Stanley for the strong winds of the front to pass. Then, in a day or two, the wind should ease, giving Michael the opportunity to get sailing. Stanley is famous for the nut, a huge rock sticking out into Bass Strait. It's been a landmark for European seafarers since 1798, when Bass and Flinders first sighted it. The nut is the stump of an old volcano, and while Michael is always keen to explore new places, there are things oh, to do. Yeah. And you're going to do that in that little boat? Bob and Nancy are on holiday from yeah, Adelaide yeah. and came across Bass Straight the normal way I via the car ferry. You'll be on your own. Well, these guys are going to follow me in the, uh, in the power boat. I am. Bass Strait too. Well, how long do you expect to take? Well, Bob's question is a good one, but I can only guess at this stage. It's time to get the laser ashore. And helping Tim and I is Arthur Brett, my coach from the Athens Olympics, and himself a sailing world champion. Okay. Now all that gymnastic training come in handy. When I first told Arthur of the idea, he laughed for a few seconds and then said, I'd love to be a part of it. How can I help? He's been a huge help with logistics and preparation. <laughs> Here we go. Getting the boat into Tasmania. It dawns on me that this is actually going to happen. Months of talking and planning are practically over, and there's just one big day ahead of us, subject to weather conditions. Stanley is a small town, and locals are soon aware of anything that's different on their turf. No worries. Yep, I reckon they'd do it. Experienced man. Solid. I wouldn't get on it. <laughs> it's good to have people around you you know well when you're attempting something like this. Arthur is mild mannered, thoughtful, and loves the challenge. He's uh, fighting fit and mentally prepared, so that should be good. Uh, just a dream to coach, the most motivated person I've ever come across, and doesn't need too much encouragement. It's been an absolute pleasure. So this, this to me is uh, a chance to be with him in a moment of uh, something special.
Yeah, it's doable. It's going to be tough. Look, if it was easy, anyone would do it. Uh, this is going to stretch his limits for sure. I, I think the difference with this is we don't fully know what to expect. Whereas an Olympic, Olympic Games, you've got things mapped out pretty well. You've had that experience before. But nobody has sailed a laser across Bass Strait before. So we're going into uncharted territory. In the last 14 years I've been sailing a laser, I've always been excited about going out in the strongest winds because that's the most fun. I once went out in about 45 to 50 knots, though it's hard to tell when it gets that strong. That day I went out in Sydney Harbour, I thought I might not be able to make it back in. I had the sail out flapping and I was leaning flat out and still couldn't keep the boat down. But eventually I made it back. In this mast cam footage, I was out off Sydney Heads in 35 to 40 knots, preparing for the worst Bass Strait could deliver. If it blew this hard, it would be almost impossible to make the crossing, because I was doing everything I could just to keep the boat on its feet. Notice the tiller is rarely in the middle, and the arms are working the sheet all the time to maintain the balance of power in the boat. The secret to not capsizing in these conditions is being very firm with the boat, in terms of sheeting and steering, so you always stay in a good groove with the boat fairly flat. So when a big gust hits, you have to grunt up and fight the boat's desire to go its own way. Sometimes you'll be going too fast and crash into a short, steep wave in front. This often means a capsize, as the whole bow is buried and the cockpit fills with water. However, with experience, you might be able to steer out of it and keep the boat upright. Notice I've got one foot under the hiking strap and the other under the tow rail, trying to lock myself into the boat. It takes good technique and strength in the arms to sheet and steer effectively. The trick is to anticipate what the next gust or wave will do to the boat in terms of rolling it one way or the other. I'm always looking around at the shape of the waves in the front and to either side of the boat to decide which way to steer next. However, the constant spray sometimes makes it pretty hard to see anything. Doing this sort of sailing without capsizing and having fun at the same time has given me the confidence that I can sail a laser across Bass Strait. There's more of this footage in the extra section of the DVD. This will get him across Bass Strait. This abalone. Good tucker. It's turned into a cooking show. <laughs> It used to be called mutton fish when the first settlers hey, came. Hey Tim, is this going to be a long story? Fuck, are you? I'm getting hungry. It's getting a bit, starting to get a little bored now. Uh, yeah, just want to sort of get into it. Uh, get over the other side. With most of the preparation done, there's nothing they can do about the weather. So now they have to wait for the right day to do the crossing. Michael needs the wind to be southwest and in the range of 15 to 20 knots. Much lighter and it will take too long. If it's too strong, there could be trouble. They call for the automated weather station reports. Gusting to 33 knots, pressure 1,013 hectopascals. At 5 p.m., Cape Quinn was reporting wind west southwest at 14 knots, gusting to 47 knots. 23 to 33 knots is a little too much, so 40 to 47 is just ridiculous. Getting the wind direction and strength right is vital to the success of the crossing, so Michael enlisted world-famous weatherman Roger Clouds Badham to let him know what winds to expect. Clouds would run his computer weather models each day for the Bass Strait area at his base in southern New South Wales. Michael rings clouds on Saturday to get his view on Sunday and Monday. Um, so the, uh, the main thing is what the bridge would be, you know, three, two hours after you start. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where it's going to be strongest. Right. Just in that gap, if you like, shooting sort of underneath and across King Island there. Eh? What time of day is that? It's 4 a.m. Oh, you know, like it, no matter what time of day, as long as you get out of the stability effect of the land,
The verdict is that the front and associated low pressure system have hung around a lot longer than they normally do and it's probably going to be too windy for a couple of days. Today it gusted to 35 knots in the strait. Onions to go with the baked beans this morning. Plenty of food actually is the diet basically. Um, some might say a seafood diet, you see seafood and you eat it. Um, so I'm just trying to put on a bit of weight basically just to try and uh, help me out during the crossing. My experience in preparing for big events like Olympics and World Championships is that it's better to be fresh and rested than be tired from last minute training. In the last few days before a big event, there is nothing you can do that will help you perform other than rest, relax and eat. It's Sunday and yet another front is due to come through tonight, so it's no go tomorrow. The winds are going to be about 25 knots or so tomorrow in Bass Strait and the waves probably uh, sort of two and a half metres or so. So just on the upper edge of things and to be safe we're going to leave it one more day. I thought I'd be sailing by now and this waiting around is starting to get to me. So I wheel my boat from the marina around to the launching ramp a few hundred metres away to take up some time. You can sense that the air here is really clean and in fact until it hits the west coast of Tasmania some 50 k's from here it's seen nothing but oceans for thousands of miles. Wherever I go I'm always looking at the water for what it tells me about the wind's strength and direction. Today it's a few knots less than it has been but it would still be fresh to frightening a few miles offshore. It might be fun for a few hours of sailing, but more than that, and the errors will start creeping in, including capsizes, and that will lead to more fatigue, and so on. When I'm at a regatta, I like to get pole position at the top of a boat ramp, so I can launch early, and unconsciously I park the boat there. But I don't think there'll be too many lasers competing for a spot today. Back on the Cheviot, Michael rings clouds to get an update. Early tomorrow morning, it's still got it's got 22 knots offshore from where you are first thing in the morning, early morning. Michael, Arthur and Tim discuss the weather each day, and after a while, it becomes obvious that Tim wants to be really cautious. Tim lives on the edge of Bass Strait, and he's seen it at its worst. So no, I reckon we should wait till yeah. I reckon we should wait till Wednesday morning. Um, not, you know, yeah, probably be all right tomorrow, but you know, I reckon it's still a bit marginal. And you know, if you sail across on Wednesday, and if it's easy and that sort of thing, which I don't think it is going to be, um, and then someone, and then Crystal comes and does it and knocks five hours off your time, well then you can come back and do it in a gale. But for the first time, it's never been done before, I think that you should go conservatively. The 20 to 25 knot forecast for tomorrow is about what I expected the sailing, and I think it's well within my abilities, so I wanted to go. But with his vast knowledge of the strait and the keys to the support boat, I had to respect Tim's opinion. So we set our sights on starting the crossing Wednesday morning, but in the back of my mind, I'm a little worried that it's going to be too light. But there's nothing else I can do about it. Doing a bit of sightseeing in Stanley. We're going up the chairlift to the top of the nut. Uh, it's uh, blowing a fair bit now. It's only about 25, 30 knots as we go up. I've got to hold my hat on. And uh, once we get up to the top, we'll have a look over the top and see your uh, bass straight. See how that's looking today. As windy as it is, this place is gorgeous. So it makes waiting around a little easier. in Stanley, just climbed up to the top of the mountain. It's a little too windy, as you can tell, but it's far the best back straight in a way than now. Oh, it's a little hard to stand up here in fact.
winds today were quite surprising. The low pressure system is just hanging around a lot longer than we expected. Uh, we're fortunate in have the day after the Wednesday is going to be winds uh, about 15 knots or so and the, and the seas will be a lot less. Stanley's a nice place, but this ain't no travel documentary, so it's time to get things ready to go. I've rigged a laser literally a thousand times and always try to make sure that no part of the boat will fail on the water, and this time it's more important than ever. I chose to use virtually a brand new boat because I'll be pretty sure that nothing will break. What we're going to do now is rig the boat up as much as possible uh, and then uh, just pull the mast out and then uh, we'll have it have just about three minutes of rigging ready to do at 2am tomorrow morning so we can just get out of bed and get down to the boat quickly and, and get out there straight away. Uh, excited to get going, it's been a long time uh, preparing, a long time waiting and to finally uh, have the right weather conditions uh, is, is great now. We've been uh, quite patient waiting for the good sort of breezes so to actually, actually get going it's a bit of a relief at this stage so yeah. Pumped, ready to go. As I rig and check everything on the boat, I'm convinced that I've prepared well enough to avoid any problems. It's basically just my normal laser vang. All I've done is just put a, a thicker line on here to uh, you know, just add a bit of reliability, add a bit of strength to the rope. Again with the Cunningham, we've got a slightly thicker rope going through the sail there and a slightly thicker rope through this baseline back to a handle that I can control again just to be safe. First part of the voyage is going to be at night uh, and it'll be dark funnily enough at night. We've got this light stick, a uh, simple thing. What happens is we just shake it and bend it and it provides a little bit of glow over the compass so you can see the compass from sitting down the back of the boat. I've been excited about this. I bought, slashed out and bought three dollars worth of spray can of paint and decided to paint my centerboard bright orange so it'll be quite visible during the day. A little radical for a laser fin, they're normally all white, but uh, I think this should work, work worthy of it. Some of the other items I have on board are, include a, a GPS with mapping software on there, a VHF radio so can you can communicate with the support boat. Got an inflatable life jacket and a tether to go on that to keep me connected to the boat during the evening. And in my little pocket here I've got a couple of flares in case we get in trouble I can uh, signal uh, the rescue boat or plane. Got another glow stick there to help me uh, illuminate things on board. This last one is my little food stash. Got a couple of uh, energy bars and, and carbohydrate gels to uh, keep me fired up. Back here a couple of water bottles carrying about uh, two litres of water to start with there. And I'm Probably get some more off the power boat later. And uh, in here, just a few, another banana, another uh, drink or two in there, just as spares. Apart from the colour of the centreboard, this boat is completely standard. All the same, I still attract a few locals wondering what it must be. I reckon uh, that'll be a record for the uh, Guinness Book of Records if it does that. So, what do you reckon about tomorrow, Tim? Well, I've just spoken to Gary Kerr, my fisherman friend, and he reckons 14 knots at 4 a.m puffing up to 15 to 16 knots at about midday and then later on in the afternoon about 14 knots again but interestingly the next day they're only forecasting 14 knots but from the west so it's going to back to the west I reckon these weather conditions are absolutely perfect for for what you want to do Michael touch wood <laughs> that's great so, with the green light on for tomorrow morning, Arthur flies back to the mainland. He'll help with the retrieval of the boat at the other end. And Michael heads home to pack and make a final choice about what he'll be wearing tomorrow. I think it's better to be warm than cool on the water. So I'll start with a three-quarter length wetsuit, a lightweight rash shirt, then a thin thermal jumper, a slightly thicker thermal, a thermal thicker again, a Ronston neoprene top and a light spray jacket. It's going to be fairly cold out there, so that's just a little more than what I would normally wear when racing in cold weather. But for the early morning start, I'll also wear some offshore pants, an offshore jacket, a balaclava, a PFD, a harness, a tether, and socks and boots. 
I hope to be able to strip off the big pants and jacket once it warms up during the day. I take a walk and can't help having one last look. This is the view off the nuts uh, looking over uh, Bass Strait. If we pan up a little we can see a big expanse of water in the distance, lots of cloud, a bit of wind and that's what I'll be facing tomorrow morning at about 2am. sunscreen on. You can see the earliest I've ever put sunscreen on. It's probably not going to do much because it only lasts for four hours. It's about the only time I can since I'll probably be wet for the next 15 hours or so. I wake up as planned at 2am and put on my base layer of clothes. I have a banana and a sports drink to help get me started for the long day ahead. It feels like I've had enough sleep to get by and I'm excited that it's finally happening. I shut the door in my accommodation for the last time at 2.20am and quietly walk the 500 metres to my boat. Stanley's a quiet town, but it feels like I have to tiptoe to my boat not to wake anyone. My thoughts turn to the weather conditions. The sky is fairly clear, it's cool but not cold, and it feels like an 8 to 10 knot breeze is blowing. Just about perfect for the start of the trip. My only worry is the wind might be too light, and I wonder if we should have gone yesterday. I can't do anything about that, so now I just want to get out there as quickly as possible and into a stronger air flow further offshore. At this stage I'm feeling a lot different to just before a race at the Olympics. During the Olympics I'd usually feel more pressure on myself. This fast straight crossing involves a lot more of the unknown and I figure that there's no point in getting stressed about what I don't know. What I do know is that I can sail really well. But will I be up to sailing a laser in Bass Strait in the dark? You all set? I think so. Everything's ready to go. How's your body? Oh, it's a little sleepy. But uh, that's all right, that's what we expected. So, uh, Toasty warm though, plenty of gear on. A bit more left to put on too actually. So uh, yeah, it's looking forward to it. I finished getting dressed, pushed my boat into the water. Once again, it's a familiar thing to do, but this is the first time at 3 a.m with plans to sail 115 miles from stop. drift offshore slowly and start to get a feel for the wind strength while I put my socks and boots on. The lights from the town help a little, but the depth of the darkness quickly becomes apparent. Okay at this stage, let's see how it goes. The first few hours involve some of the most extraordinary sailing ever done. The concentration needed to keep the boat upright and moving along at full speed fills my senses completely and I have few thoughts of anything else. About a mile offshore the wind steadies at about 15 knots with a slight wave, or at least I think so, because I can't see a thing apart from my compass and the white light of the support boat from 100 metres in front. The 15 knots of wind from the southwest puts me on a perfect reaching angle and my GPS says I'm planning at 8 to 10 knots towards the tidal river. As I get further away from shore, I can feel the waves getting bigger, but can't tell for sure because it's so dark. 
A couple of times I put my bow into the wave in the front. Water pours over the deck, filling the cockpit. I come close to capsizing and think about sailing more conservatively. I'm going well, I don't want to slow down now. So I just move my weight further back in the boat and try to keep the bow up. Nonetheless, I submerge the bow a few more times. There's a faint glow from the lights of Stanley on the horizon behind me, and not much else. It's like sailing across black velvet, and I actually wonder if my eyes are open. The feeble light from the glow sticks is absorbed completely, and I have only a vague idea of the sort of seaway I'm doing. Ironically, when the light from the camera comes on, it gets even darker. I'm sure I can see all of the sail, but I would have sailed into a brick wall if it was right in front of me. It doesn't really worry me, but Tim soon lets the cameraman know. I was looking forward to the dawn as well. At about 6.30 a.m. the sky started to lose its blackness and I could start to see the outline of the waves. And they aren't as big as I thought, up to about a metre. I'm pleased that the most difficult part of the crossing could well be behind me. I was going to stop and check in with Tim about how things are going, but the sea makes it hard to get close to the powerboat. With such a long way to go and no guarantee of the wind holding out, I just want to keep moving forward with speed. Now that I can see the waves, I can also start to use them properly and do some surfing. This is what I've been looking forward to for months, so I start to work the boat a bit more. Before dawn, the weight from the powerboat was just another set of waves to trip me up, but now they're a chance to have some fun. There's only water in every direction and it's still overcast with the temperature about 16 degrees and the southwesterly is blowing at 15 knots. First light also reveals a sharp cloud line developing behind him, just like you'd see with a cold front. It also looks like it has a bit of rain in it, which means more wind as well. I think, hello, what has Bass Strait got for me today? The wind increases a few knots ahead of the cloud. Nothing too difficult, but that can be a sign of more to come. I keep looking over my shoulder and get myself set for more wind. The same cloud shadowed me for the next two hours, but luckily its energy petered out. It's warmed up slightly, but I've gotten a little wet from spray getting beneath my jacket and pants, so my body temperature is just right. Time and distance are travelling relatively quickly in my head, thanks to a perfect set of conditions. I check my GPS and I'm happily surprised when it says I've averaged 8.1 knots so far. If I can keep this up, I'll be in Tidal River well before dark. It's going really well. I've never seen a, a boat handle like that. He's just uh, absolutely awesome in this job. Got about, what have we got? 14 knots, I suppose. Southwest. And uh, he's been sailing for a few hours now, must be getting tired. But uh, he's just going from one surf to Thank you. 
When I was at university, I spent a lot of time sailing, but also managed to do my PhD thesis on what endurance athletes think. I learned how to maintain focus over long periods, as well as stay amused and relaxed when faced with a difficult task. This helped me get to an international standard in a laser, and it's helping me now by being conscious of pacing myself and tuning in to the important things about the waves and wind. But my thoughts also drift at times, and I think about nothing to do with sailing, or nothing at all. By nine o'clock, the wind drops a little, to about 10 knots, and it becomes a little more difficult to get up on the plane, but the waves are big enough now to keep surfing. I start to wonder what the chances are of it glassing out. Almost the worst scenario than a big blow, as all power to my little boat will be gone. Oh, awesome sailor. Unbelievable. I can't believe he can stand up sailing along in this, and he just stands up to stretch and that sort of thing. I start to get a little stiff in the back arms and legs, so I get into a few different positions to relieve the soreness. The guys on the support boat think it might be showing off a little as I surf the waves while lying face down, kneeling and lying face up. However, these things I tried in training as well. I thought I would have a few breaks during the trip where I would stop the boat, but I felt good and the boat felt like it was going fast. So my racing attitude took over and I just kept trying to go as quick as possible. I barely know how to do anything else anyway, because for more than a decade, I've been trying to make one of these little boats go faster and I actually find it at odds with all my training to slow down and have a break. I take the chance with the lighter wind to refuel with a carbohydrate gel. My eating and drinking plan involves a lot of carbohydrate, sports drink, energy drink, little sachets of carbohydrate gels, bananas and sports bars, all stuff which is digested easily and will help with my endurance. It isn't always easy to eat though. I have to clean off the main sheet and tuck the tiller extension under my arm while breaking open the packaging. Then I have to keep the boat on track while squeezing the last of the gel out and finally store my rubbish in my little bin. A lot of the time it probably looks like I'm just sitting there. Well I am, but at the same time I'm also doing some little things to keep the average speed up. In these marginal planing conditions, you need to really keep the boat flying between the waves. It's easy enough to do a little pump of the main sheet to get the boat to surf down one wave, but that's not enough to maintain a high average speed. What I'm doing is constantly scanning the shape of the waves to the front and to each side to help decide which way to steer the boat. If the wave is smaller than average, it can pay to steer up and get off the wave early in order to keep your boat speed up so you're ready to catch the next wave. This option avoids excessive slowing of the boat and increases the chances of catching the next wave. If it's a bigger wave, you want to extract the most out of it you can by getting the boat perpendicular to the wave with the bow low and stern high and steer down into the trough. The whole time you're trying to stay on the biggest part of the wave, whether it means steering slightly to the left or to the right. As much as possible, the steering is done by rolling the boat with the body and by trimming the sail rather than using the rudder. Sometimes you'll get a period of flatter water that you can't really do much with. Usually it's best to head up a little to keep the speed up, all the time scanning the water for the next wave and another surfing opportunity. A lot of the time my focus is on going through the motions I just described, trying to get the most out of the boat and waves. This reach is fairly broad and I'm a little above the rum line at the moment, so I'm continually trying to get rides on waves that will take me down to Leeward. I'm disappointed when I miss a wave I thought I could catch, but that miss gives me the feedback I need to readjust my idea of which waves can be caught. Any disappointment of missing a wave only lasts until I catch the next one. And for the most part, I'm a tad excited about the whole thing. The thought of how many hours or miles to go never weighs me down because my focus is often narrowed in on just the next wave or two. But in the back of my mind, I'm aware that I'm almost in the middle of Bass Strait and I'm not meant to be getting away with being here in such a small boat. At the times when the wind is on the lighter side, I think I'd like a bit more, but when it does come, I find it intimidating and quickly pay my respects to the wind gods because of where I am in the world. A 
begin to think that the guys on the support boat are getting a little bored, as they seem to be constantly talking on the satellite phone. It turns out to be media calls with ABC Radio in Tasmania and Melbourne wanting updates. 774 ABC Melbourne, which is subs in the afternoon, and Michael Blackburn is the person in the 14 foot boat. It is a laser, the world's most popular adult sailboat. Uh, we've managed to make contact with Tim Phillips, who's the skipper of the support boat. Hi, Tim. G'day, Richard. How are you? Not too bad, but who cares? I'm sitting down in air conditioned comfort. How are you? I'll be going really well here. We talked to a guy yesterday who went up really tall mountains for a living. So I'm kind of on a roll here, talking to people of, who do stuff I can't conceive of doing. This just seems really unpleasant. Can you ever hear high pitched screaming as he's going down the face of the three metre wave? No, uh, he's just sitting there, he's totally in control. Um, he's just coming up to us now, he's about, uh, well, I suppose he's only about 50 or 60 metres away from us, and the cameraman's going to film him as he uh, searches past. About 11am, the wind picks up again to 15 to 17 knots and the waves get larger as well. The effort it takes to control the boat increases, but it looks like Michael is still having a great time. I had studied the marine charts of my route for a few months, but something that isn't on the chart is this oil rig in the middle of the strait. I first saw it as a flame above the water, and then two hours later, I was underneath it. Given this was probably my only chance for a bit of sightseeing, I went in close for a good look. These things look massive, but also very fragile up close. This one sits in about 80 metres of water, and I'm sure the workers are thankful for the helicopter and pad to make a quick exit when the weather gets wild. I wave up at the guys staring down at me from the platform, but they just keep on staring. Then I hear on the radio a guy on the rig saying that I just sailed within its 500 metre exclusion zone, and I thought, whoops, better get out of here. There's probably a $100,000 fine. Tim explained what we were doing on the radio, and to my relief they said, no worries mate. I've since discovered that under the Petroleum Act of 1967, entering the exclusion zone is punishable by a fine of up to $100,000, or imprisonment, or both. The wind drops again to about 12 to 14 knots, and I'm worried that it will soften further as the sky is becoming grey and uniform often a sign of a steady or dying breeze. I've made good speed so far, and I don't want to drift into the finish. When you sail a lot, it seems like some days you keep wishing for conditions you don't have at the moment, and I'm going through a bit of that now. At no stage during the crossing did I think I wouldn't make it, but I really didn't know what was ahead of me, or what sort of wind and waves might come up behind me. All the time it felt like a major change from normal racing, where you're always looking for the bottom mark to go around. But thankfully, there'd be no bottom mark today, no upwind leaks, barely any hiking, and I could keep reaching all the way to the finish. Dream conditions for most sailors. <laughs> afternoon the clouds become whiter and fluffier and the wind starts to pick up again, gusting to 22 knots. A little squall catches me by surprise while I'm eating. I have to drop my banana and start sailing accurately for the next 15 minutes to keep the boat upright. At some stage I hit my top speed of 19.7 knots. When I get the chance to relax again, I find the banana has been stepped on, but I was looking forward to it, and although it's a little salty and mushy, I enjoyed immensely. Now they are well away from the protection of King Island in Western Bass Strait and are seeing decent ocean swells. I start to feel that my body is getting a lot more fatigued now from reaching on one tap for seven hours. My back is stiff throughout, my bottom is soggy and irritated, and my arms are way weaker. I keep on doing some stretching and mobility exercises to reduce the discomfort. My favourite position is lying face down like I'm body surfing, although I also have to hold on with my hands and feet. The waves keep getting bigger, and I'm still having a great run. Well, actually a reach. It's starting to look like I'm making a good time. I haven't capsized yet, and to put pressure on myself to stay focused, I set myself a goal of not doing so. 
Occasionally the wave's going to want to turn the boat the wrong way. In this case, I get firm with the boat, sometimes exaggerating my body movements, sheeting and steering to stay on course. In these conditions you've actually got two types of waves to deal with. There are the bigger and longer ocean swells, which are often left over from when it was windier in the last few days. Swells move quite quickly and you have to be going quite quick to catch them. Overlaid on top of these swells are smaller and shorter wind waves, which are a lot easier to catch, but only offer a short surf. Sometimes you get a great chance to surf when a swell and a bigger wind wave join together. At other times it seems like you have a series of speed humps in front of you and you can't quite generate the speed to get over them. In this case you've got to avoid going by turning more radically up towards the wind direction or down away from it. Usually you'd want to turn up towards the wind as then you'll have more apparent wind and more power in the sail and that'll give you more speed and more options. When the wind increases a few more knots you may have enough power to push the boat right over or through some of the smaller waves and this feels great. My GPS says I'm right on course and I start to scan the horizon ahead for the first sight of land. At this stage the seas are about two and a half meters and I'm still loving it. The end is almost in sight but Wilson's promontory has a big reputation for difficult sailing. Yeah. 
Nelson's promontory slowly comes into view. First are some islands offshore and a mountain range half in the cloud. Gradually more of the landscape is revealed and the excitement grows. There's this huge rock on the tip of the prom that has a big hole in it, called Skull Rock. And for a minute or so, I just stare at it. I try to imagine the wind and wave conditions that took over the years to carve out such a large piece, but I can't. The wind softens a little again, but the waves are still big, slowing things down a bit. The swells are just a little too small and round, and the wind too light to be able to catch them freely. Years ago, when I first got out of sight of land on a boat, I fully appreciated how big oceans are and how slow boats are compared with cars and planes. When you're doing a passage at sea, it's like you're in a desert of water and sky that has many different moods and colours. With no landmarks to pass, it can seem like the distances are so large that you're not getting anywhere. For that reason, seeing land again can be a source of relief and pride in your navigation and persistence. distance behind, there's another rain squall developing, and that will mean more wind for the final push to Tidal River. I keep watching this rain cloud come out behind me, and judge how long before the extra wind will be with me. A bit more breeze will be good for the final stages, as my course will take me inside Glenny Island, meaning flatter water. Tim motors ahead to drop anchor and make sure the shore break is safe for Michael to finish the crossing and set foot on the mainland. Within a few miles of the beach, the squall hits at 25 knots, sending me towards the tidal river at 10 to 14 knots. There are just one metre wind waves now, and it feels like I'm going as fast as I can handle the boat right now. I have no chance to eat or drink, even though I can feel my body fading some more, and I'm doing all I can to avoid making any errors. This is fantastic sailing, but I'm too tired to enjoy it fully, as I'm paranoid a wave or gust I'd normally handle with ease to tip me. It's also getting gusty now, closer to the land, and I have to tell myself to stay focused with my grip on the main sheet until the weakening. I'm still going at full speed, but I'm not entirely sure where to go because I've never actually been to this beach before. But within one kilometre of the finish, it becomes obvious I'm on target and I can make out the support boat and some people on the beach. There are no real obstacles left. Because I've been in a sort of zone all day making this boat go forward, I think to myself that I'm going to find it weird to have to stop. I can see Arthur in the water near the middle of the beach ready to catch me, but I want to land at the end of the beach where the wind and wave will be less, and I try and signal that to him. Great effort, mate. What a moment this is. I'm really proud too. The world wants to speak to you. And at 4.31 at the sheltered end of the beach of Tidal River, I've suddenly finished sailing across Bass Strait in a laser. But I'm too tired to get excited now. Whenever I, I do a, a big sailing thing, I like to plan it really well. I like to have all the, the elements uh, sorted out. And, and to me, the, having the end of it sorted out really well is important. So it was great to have Arthur there on the beach and see my coach at the, standing there in his wetsuit, obviously sacrificing himself and, and, uh, and uh, had this big uh, full-length smoothie wetsuit on, obviously about three mils thick, and he obviously knew what he was in for. And he came out, weighed about the boat and gave me a bit of a hug and a, a, a well done. He, he, was, uh, he was very happy to, to see me. Overall it took 13 hours and one minute at an average speed of 8.8 .8 knots. A 
Amazingly, this is the fastest recorded crossing of Bass Strait in a sailboat.